Okay, so we made it to 666 King Street West. Um, I'm here with former artistic director of Nightwood Theatre and Company of Sirens and co-founder of Theatre Centre, Cynthia Grant. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Yes, I was on the board. It was Cynthia Grant of Nightwood, Sky Gilbert, Buddies in Bad Times, Tom Sokolowski, Autumn Leaf, Richard Rose, Necessary Angel, and Richard Shoika, AKA Performance Interface. Five of us. For several years, that was the configuration. We are sitting at 666. Yeah. We have found it to have been terribly, wonderfully renovated. <laughs> the kind of reno we didn't have the money for. When we came into uh, the space at 666 King West, we had been drawn there because there was a 1981 International Theatre Festival produced by Shane Jaffe and uh, Toronto's uh, very own, he became head of the Toronto Arts Council Jim and his name is Jim Gerard. Jim Gerard. You're very good, I have to quiz you. Jim Gerard opened a late night space here in the warehouse and people like Jackie Burroughs and Paul Bettis and Andrew Score, they were all here drinking and performing everything from uh, Jim's bondage plays for my generation to Tennessee Williams. So the space was very, very cool or very hot, depending on which way you want to use that. And we decided to move here from the Danforth. On the Danforth, we'd had some very good times. We were evolving and developing as small companies, but there were some issues there, particularly around the landlord, and we wanted to make the move. So when we came here to this warehouse, it was really this great time of all these companies evolving and developing. We were um, evolving in aesthetic. You, had to, you saw work like Sky Gilbert's piece on Kavafi. Um, and the actual space became a swimming pool designed by Patsy Lang. Beautiful piece of work. The rhubarbs were really highly avant-garde at that point. We used both the basement and upstairs. Uh, we were influenced by Dada. We had live bunnies in performance. The audience moved around. It was very unexpected. Kind of the thing that Summer Works this year in 2012 kind of went back to the kind of live art um, ethos of that time. Um, AKA Performance Interface had some work with Rand Alianak here that was very interesting. We were very, very active in running the space. We did acquire, you asked me, mm -hmm. Franco, we did acquire our first general manager, Jan Dutton. She was very clever with us, helped us see through our various incorporations and grants. And all these young companies were moving towards operating grants and we were moving as fast as we could, um, at the same time evolving our, our particular style of work. Um, obviously with Buddies, um, Sky was fairly recently out and exploring uh, gay themes, whether it be um, Pasolini or Kavafi. Um, in terms of feminist work, I brought a, um, our, uh, one of our posters. It was uh, Hooligans about the life of Isadora Duncan. We also did the Yellow Wallpaper, uh, which is a classic of uh, feminism. Uh, and again, Patsy Lang um, did the design. Mary Bingo and I adapted and Mary performed. Um, these were really innovative, exciting pieces. We started to draw a lot of attention. Uh, to our kind of gang of five as creative forces. And um, we ended up on the front cover of, uh, or the front page of Now Magazine. And that was Shoika Gilbert and myself. And I believe that was 1983. Um, we were very committed to the space and seeing things forward. We brought in groups from Chicago, from England, the 1982 Theater Company. Um, Tanage Coley had come up from uh, Chicago. That's written about in the Now article. Um, so it was just this really amazing time 
we were all uh, just under 30 hitting our hitting our creative um, I won't say peak because I don't think uh, any of us peaked at that point um, but certainly we were consolidating the kind of work that we wanted to do Richard Shoikat and I had been very influenced by Mabu Mines uh, in New York, I'd actually apprenticed with Mabu Mines and, and Richard had studied with them. Uh, Tom Sokolowski had an uh, incredible breadth of knowledge of the Europeans mm. and had, had traveled in Europe a great deal. Um, uh, Richard Rose and Skye um, uh, were also working through what their emphasis would be. Um, as I say, uh, you know, Richard Rose uh, uh, over on Danforth had been producing very strong Canadian pieces. Mm -hmm. Boom was one of his. It's interesting to see what was going on with all of us. And you know, you have to check your documents because it's 30 years. How long did it take <laughs> each company to hit operating level? I'd say about 1983. Um, that's still pretty good for these, oh, yeah. for these days. I yeah. mean, that's the, the field wasn't as crowded then, yeah. because you find with uh, something like the Fringe Festival, uh, young companies became like bunnies then, reproducing. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody and his dog had a theater company uh, coming out. But at that point, um, we were the new generation, and um, <clears throat> unfortunately, Paul Bettis had stopped producing at Theater Second Floor. Um, and I say unfortunately because he was the strongest avant-garde voice at the mm -hmm. time. Uh, and then you had the kind of uh, people that we know about at Pass Marai and um, Tarragon Factory. Yeah. And you know, very important people, just not kind of playing with style as much as we were. And then of course, as well with the Theater Center group, you see you know, a gay theater company and a women's theater company forming and you know it's no surprise those two companies have lasted and flourished because yeah. there was a real need for it and there yeah. continues to be yeah. and there perhaps always will be I, I don't know I um, so. yeah so it was just like amazing and you know this wall I don't know I think they even restored the brick a bit but <laughs> there were pillars okay describe the space for us well it was very long and hardwood floor switch creek now we just heard a door slam, but we had creaking floors during performance that sometimes the critics would write about, would mention. <laughs> and um, these pillars had to be designed around, but we had some quite fascinating designers at the time. And the ceiling height wasn't terrific. So again, in terms of lighting, it was a challenge, but you had a lot of mood from the warehouse experience. Um, and uh, I mentioned the basement, uh, once around a rhubarb, but also I think it's important to remember that the basement of 666 King is the first space that I think Hilary LaToya uh, did uh, his W.H. Auden piece. And I think, um, you know, from the Shaw Festival, we had Christopher coming in and checking out what was going on. So, um, you know, that was really significant for all of us to have. Uh, Christopher taking an interest, mm -hmm. you know, the artistic director of Shaw, and also uh, Mark Charnicky was the, um, I believe he was the Charles author. Star. No, he was the author, I think, of McLean's article oh. about us coming out of this era. Thing you have five companies developing, right? And then you have the theater center. Well, the theater center really was largely what we were doing, right? So, um, so that when you, you left, know. Yes, so, yes, that's true. When we left, it was more, well, what were the seasons, etc. But I think the legacy is so clear when you look at Nightwood mm -hmm. and Buddies and Necessary Angel. Um, Tom continues to do work internationally yeah, yes. that's highly conceptual. And um, so, you know, that's pretty good. Because yeah. uh, I can... The companies, for instance, that were over at Adelaide Port were three companies. And uh, two of them I know for sure disappeared. And I can't remember the third what right was now. Adelaide Port. Adelaide, was that Adelaide Port uh, was where the courthouse was. That's right. right. And the courthouse. And that was Jeff Francais, was that? Well, yeah, I don't know whether they were the third. That's why I said I'm not okay. sure what the third was. 
but um, um, no, it wasn't a factory. No, these companies disappeared. New Theater um, and. Uh, Okay, I didn't prep for this. Oh, I actually can't okay, remember okay. them, but that's what happened. Three companies went in there. They were full, like, what's a generation in theater? Well, they were a generation above us. They yeah. had established about six, five to seven, eight years yeah. ahead of us. Mm -hmm. They grew to the point where they could take on this historic building, spend tens of thousands, actually hundreds of thousands, on a reno. Mm -hmm. and some maintain that too much went into the reno and that's why it didn't um, carry on. Um, some say, well, you know, it couldn't be sustained in Toronto at that time. But it's very tricky to backtrack and try and put it together. But meanwhile, as they disappeared, we came on up. Right. So, you know, there's a real evolution uh, within a community or sets of communities, yeah. really. And um, I think the more that you and I would discuss it, the the uh, the better we could co-analyze it, because, and then look at documents. But it's, uh, you know, the fact that you know almost nothing about Adelaide Court says to me, well, it was an even bigger operation, and nothing survives it, right? right. Really, that's out yeah. there and kind of commonly yeah. known. Yeah, fair enough. Um, parlance or whatever, right? Like you'd have to really dig or be there at the yeah. time. We have to look at a couple of posters now. <laughs> so on this one, you'll see that uh, this rhubarb, and that's Kim Render's face, had Daniel Brooks, Svetlana Zylan, Jan Kadelka. Well, Daniel Brooks and Sky. I mean, you just start to see some of the names um, that carried on. We were quite young at the time. I mean, we, this is 30 years ago. Yeah. And uh, the hooligans poster as well is kind of cool. So this one was a fairly collective piece. Um, Jan Kadelka was uh, the writer, but uh, a lot of us participated. And it surrounded the great artists around uh, 1900, Isadora Duncan and uh, Scott of the Antarctic, and um, the people connected to them, including Sergei Asenian, who was a white Russian poet of great notoriety in Russia, and he had been married to Isadora Duncan. Um, Scott of the Antarctic, I think for us, we were thinking that uh, um, major exploration kind of final frontiers were being both in, broken both in art mm -hmm. and in terms of global exploration. I mean, once you find the Antarctic, where else is there? Well, yeah. of course, Mars right now, but yes. <laughs> anyways, that was a cool piece. We also loved the title yes. Hooligans because they were called that and we felt ourselves to be somewhat of the hooligans <laughs> here.